Proudly we hail. From New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players and featuring Norman Rose as the narrator and Lawson Zerby as James Andrews. Public service time has been made available by the station for your Army and your Air Force to bring you this story as proudly we hail the Medal of Honor. is entitled Medal of Honor, a salute to the highest military award for bravery which the United States of America can give. Our first act curtain will rise after this important message, an important message for the young men of our country. If you think you can hold down a man's job, there's a man's job waiting for you in your country's rapidly expanding United States Army. Go to your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station and get all the facts today. The Medal of Honor. When a man wins this symbol of bronze wreathed in green enamel, and held by a white starred ribbon of blue silk. He has found a place in history as one of America's most gallant heroes. But it was not always so, for the Medal of Honor has had a stormy career. The idea for the Medal of Honor was advanced nearly a century ago, back in 1861. But the committee rooms in Congress heard months of heated argument before the idea was finally adopted. Gentlemen, gentlemen, if you please. I know this has become a controversial subject here in Washington. I'd hope we might discuss the matter quietly. That's better. Uh, General Townsend, it's utterly preposterous to give an American soldier a medal. He doesn't fight for a trinket to put on his uniform. He fights for his country. Yeah, 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 yeah. The medal is more than a trinket, Mr. Congressman. An indication that a man's country appreciates his extraordinary gallantry. How about the certificate of merit? We've had that for the last 15 years. Isn't that sufficient appreciation? The certificate of merit was a step in the right direction, yes. But it's only a document, a piece of paper. Soldier doesn't wear a piece of paper on his uniform so he can tell everybody, read this, it says I'm a hero. <laughs> so because a soldier doesn't like to talk about his honor, let's supply him with a token of that honor which he can wear without words. General Townsend, we have already given promotions in rank to our heroes and more money. Isn't that enough of a token? Sir, if you look all through history, you'll never find a soldier who has any objection to more money. <laughs> but when promotions are handed out the way they've been handed out lately, an increase in rank means absolutely nothing. <laughs> Sorry, gentlemen, if I seem to describe present company too accurate. General Townsend, I hope you don't think you have a new idea here with your Medal of Honor. It seems to me I recall that George Washington gave out a medal called the Purple Heart. Now, isn't that so? The Purple Heart was given out only three times, Senator. And that was 75 years ago. Well, what about the Andre Medal? Again, only three times. That was 85 years ago. <laughs> Before that, there was a special medal to George Washington, another one to Light Horse Harry Lee, one to General Horatio Gates. It was so big he couldn't wear it. And that's all. Been doing a little research, haven't you, General? Yes, I've been doing a little research. I've been doing a lot of observing. How's that? As you know, several officers from the European armies have come over here, offer their services to our government in this national crisis. Yes? Well, in almost every case, they display some very fine-looking European medals on their chests. 
And I've noticed that our young aspirants to military glory are pretty envious. <coughs> General, if European soldiers wear medals, that's just one more reason why Americans should not wear medals. Seems to me the idea for which we fought in the revolution was to, to make a complete break with Europe and all its titles and trappings and its uh, pomp and circumstance. Why, Senator, I you maybe that we never did I... break with all the European ideas and institutions. I say if monarchies developed medals which their soldiers wore with pride while serving the monarchy, maybe we should borrow a page from their book, develop a medal which our soldiers can wear with pride while serving democracy. General Townsend. Yes, Mrs. Dupree. Winfield Scott does not agree with you. I know because I just talked to him. But I agree with you. Well, thank you, Ms. Dupree. But maybe we're unwise in disagreeing with the General in Chief of the Army. I do not think we are unwise at all, because I happen to know how deeply honored the soldiers of Napoleon felt when he awarded them the Legion of Honor. Mostly, I think, because they knew it was not just an award for generals. Soldiers of any rank could win it. That's the way it must be with America's Medal of Honor, Mrs. Dupree must be given to the man who is highest in bravery, although he may be lowest in rank. I say this because I know that when all other defenses of a government fail, that government's survival depends on the lengths of personal bravery which the men in uniform are willing to go in order to save it from destruction. A few months later, the Medal of Honor found another champion. On the 17th of February, 1862, Senator Henry Wilson of Massachusetts spoke from the floor of the Senate. And therefore, my resolution provides for the presentation of Medals of Honor to the men of the Army and volunteer forces who shall most distinguish themselves by their gallantry in action and other soldier-like qualities. Thank you. Senator Wilson? Yes? Uh, the Secretary of War sitting in the rear of the Senate. He'd like to speak with you. Oh, thank you. Uh, pardon me, gentlemen. Pardon me. Oh, uh, where's the Secretary? Oh, oh, yes. Good afternoon, Senator Wilson. How do you do? I think your resolution is a very good one. Thank you, Secretary Stanton. And I think you should be especially interested in these designs. Hmm? Uh, what are these? Designs for the new Navy Medal. They were sent to me by James Pollock, director of the Mint in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Hmm. His letter says that this design would also be suitable for an army medal. All right, George, he's right. Now, this anchor here, the Navy, could uh, be easily changed to, uh, uh, say, an eagle standing on two cross cannon for the army. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, who designed these? A, a Frenchman with a German name, Schussel. And the dyes will be made by a German with a French name, Paquet. <laughs> Well, that's typical of America. <laughs> yes, it was typical of America. Because generation after generation, our great strength has always come from our mixing of the talents from many nations. Well, President Lincoln made the resolution a law in July. Secretary Stanton ordered 2,000 medals in November. And by 1863, the United States Army at last had a Medal of Honor. Next, everybody wondered who would be the first to win it. Obviously, the heroic exploits in the then current conflict were uppermost in people's minds, and new and exciting incidents were described in each day's newspaper. The most daring of these escapades was hatched in the mind of a civilian secret agent named James J. Andrews. For four months, he'd been planning out the details of his adventure, and when everything was ready, he went to an army camp near Shelbyville, Tennessee, and called for volunteers. May I have your attention, please? I'm James J. Andrews. Twenty-one of you have answered my call for volunteers. I told you the mission was extremely dangerous. It is. My plan is to sabotage the Western and Atlantic Railroad. Now, please, attention, please. Now, as you can see on this map, 
The railroad runs from Marietta, Georgia, up here to Chattanooga, Tennessee. And it's a vital supply line for the Confederate forces in Tennessee. Now, if we can tear the railroad apart to any effective degree, the state of Tennessee will be isolated from its southern supply base, and General Mitchell can move in from here and take Chattanooga. Is that clear? The idea is clear, Andrews, but uh, how do we do it? What's your name? Parrott. Jacob Parrott. You sure you want to do this? Yes, sir. All right. On the night of April 7th, all of you will disguise yourselves as civilians and go to Chattanooga. One at a time and not in groups. Is that clear? Yes, then you'll get on the train and go down to Marietta, Georgia. You'll arrive there April the 11th. The next day, you'll go back to the station, one at a time, and buy tickets on the northbound train. Buy tickets from Marietta to Big Shanty. Why Big Shanty? That's, that's only a little place. There's no telegraph office there. They won't be able to get help. Then why don't we get off at Big Shanty on the way down? Because we're taking over that train. And when we take it over, I want it to be headed north. Big Shanty, Big Shanty next. This train will stop in Big Shanty. 20 minutes for breakfast. Big Shanty. All right, Parrot. Now, this is it. You pass the word along. The passengers and the trainmen will get off on the right side of the train. We get off on the left. Walk up the gravel path to the baggage car, up at the head of the train, and take over. Is that clear? Yes, sir. All right. Now tell the others. I'll meet you in the engine cab. Quiet, Benzio. I can't help it, Andrews. The gravel. All right. Here's the baggage car. Parrot, see if the big door is unlocked on this side. Looks like it. Wait till I see if it'll slide open. Make it slow and not so noisy. Yeah. All right, that's far enough. Now, Parrot, you and Ben's here. Give these fellows a lift. Put most of the men in the baggage car, and then a few of you can take over the engine. I'll be back in a minute. Yes, sir. All right. Off you go. <laughs> next. <laughs> All right, next. Next. <laughs> Here, you two help the rest of them get in the car. Benziger, let's take over the cab. Come on. Right. All right, come on. Let's go. Maybe the engineer and the fireman aren't out of the cab yet. Oh, sure, they'll be out. They want to eat breakfast, too. I hope you're right. Okay, climb up. I'll give you a push. Yeah. Now, give me your hand and pull me up. All right. Hey. hey, what's going on here? Who are you? Uh, we, but we thought you'd gone to breakfast. What are you doing to my cab? We'll show you what we're doing. Take care of the fireman, Benziger. I got him. Come on. Get out of here, will you? Sorry, but you're the one who's getting out. Need any help, Benziger? No, I think I'm doing all right. Yeah, we better, better heave them both out of the cab. All right. Here, give me a hand. That's one of them. Come on, you're next. That's two. You uh, better get out of here in a hurry now. Yeah, you ready on the throttle? Yeah, I'm ready. How about the bell rope? Buffum was supposed to cut that. All right, then. Let's get out of here. You can't get away for Andrews. Where'd he go? Up ahead to make sure the switch is open. Oh, here he comes now. Hey, Parrot. Give me a hand. Pull me up, will you? All right. Thank you. Switch open? Yeah. Let her go. Open her up wide, Ben here. Take her north about six miles and then stop. All right. We'll tear down all the telegraph wires, do all the damage we can, pile cross ties on the tracks behind us, and start north again. Is that clear? Yeah, that's right. Uh, looks like we're right on schedule. We stopped three times to tear up the telegraph wires and barricade the tracks. Now we've already passed Calhoun. 
It looks like a clear track all the way to Chattanooga. Andrews! Andrews! Oh, what's the matter, Perry? I was back in the last passenger car watching the track behind us. Yes? And every time we hit a straightaway, we could see it. See what? There's a Confederate train following us. What? He must have broken through all the barricades. How far back are they? Well, it's hard to tell. I'd say about two miles. It looks to me like they're getting closer all the time. Now, listen, Parrot. Yes, sir? Take some more of the men back there with you. Uncouple the last passenger car and let it go. When they run into that, it'll stop them. Yes, sir. But if it doesn't stop them, uncouple another car. We've got to stop that Confederate train. Lawson Zerbe, featured in the role of James Andrews in the proudly we hail production Medal of Honor, will return in just a moment for the second act. You young men of America know that the United States Army has been expanding. However, that expansion must continue, and your help is needed. It's needed right now. You yourself can get ahead in the Army because there are many opportunities for advancement if you have initiative, courage, and leadership ability. So visit your local United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station and enlist in the United States Army today. You are listening to Proudly We Hail. Now we present the second act of Medal of Honor. As the stolen engine roars north toward Chattanooga, secret agent Andrews hurries through the swaying wooden cars toward the rear of the train. I thought Andrews was coming back here. All right, Bumpum. I said I'd be here, and I'm oh, here. Oh, good. Can't be on both ends of the train at the same time. Well, right now, Andrews, the rear end is the most important end. What is left of the rear end? How many cars have you dropped off, Parrot? Three. You any good? No. You just slow down, pick them up, keep coming. See him back there? I'd say they're about a mile and a half away. Yeah. That engine is pushing three of our passenger cars, and it's still going faster than we are. Now, wait a minute. Now, let's see. This is our last passenger car, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Come up ahead with me. What for? Come on, I'll tell you on the way. First, get everybody into the baggage car. Come on, hurry up. All right, everybody in? Yep. Now what? Uncouple that last passenger car. Help me with this, Buffum. Yeah. Uh, Got her there? Yeah. 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 There she goes. That's it. That'll slow him down for a minute or two. Now then, remember we piled up some cross ties here in the baggage car? Yeah. All right. Throw half of them out on the track, one at a time. Half of them? That's right. And the other half, pile them right here in the middle of the baggage car. Oh, you mean... Oh, uh, no, like... no, not that way. Like this. Like an Indian TP. Oh, well, what's that for? You'll Get find there. out in a minute. Now, you see that pile of papers over there? Yeah. yeah Put them well. underneath here. And set them on fire. Set the whole thing on fire. The whole baggage car? That's exactly what I mean. This wooden car will burn like tinder. All right. Here's some matches. Go ahead. Let's get it burning. Well, uh, what about the men? Get them all into the engine. It'll be a little crowded. It's the only thing we can do. All right. The uh, paper's starting to burn now. Get into the engine, all of you. And now listen to me. Just after we pass Ustanala, we go over a long wooden bridge. I want you to cut this burning baggage car loose and try to let go of it. So it'll finally stop right in the middle of that bridge. I don't know whether we can hang on to the car that long, Andrews. The whole thing's about to burst into flame. I told you to get into the engine, Parrot. Yes, sir. Now I know the whole thing's about to burst into flame. But we've got to hang on to that baggage car until we get to the bridge. Hey, look at that. They're pushing the blazing baggage car across the bridge without even stopping. Wait a minute. They, they got across all right, but they are stopping. Somebody's running ahead of the train. I was afraid of that. Afraid of what? We passed a siding back there, and this means they'll dump all of our cars on the siding and come after us, faster than ever. Fensinger, can't this engine go any faster? We're not pulling any cars. Sure, we could go fast, all right, but... But what? Now we're out of fuel. Can we make it to Graysville? I don't think so. 
Steam's going down pretty fast. All right, men, this is as far as we go. Now, you better scatter into the woods and try to keep out of sight. I'm afraid they'll be looking for us in a very few minutes. Within the next few days, Andrews and all of his 21 volunteers were captured. Andrews and seven more were court-martialed, condemned, and executed. The other 14 were sent to prison. The following October, eight of these escaped from prison, and the remaining six were finally paroled by the Confederates on the 17th of March, 1863. One week later in Washington, D.C., they found themselves being escorted through the outer office of the Secretary of War, past a whole room full of military and civil dignitaries who'd been told to wait until a very important ceremony was completed in the secretary's inner chambers. Harris, Bensinger, Buffum, Mason, Reddick, and Pittinger, would you please step into the secretary's office? Thank you. Thank you. I uh, beg your pardon, but I have an appointment with the secretary of war. Shall I go in now? I'm afraid not, General. Secretary Stanton has informed me that all appointments must wait. But this is a matter which I'm must... I'm sorry, General. Those are the Secretary's orders. Oh, here's the Secretary now. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Miss Browning. She's right, General. I'll have to see you later. Come in, gentlemen, and close the door. Gentlemen, uh, this is the Secretary of the Treasury, Simon P. Chase. And this is the Vice President, Andrew Johnson. Are you happy to meet you? Now then, uh, Private Jacob Parrott. Yes, sir. I know that all of you men have been through a very harrowing experience. We, we regret that this happened to you. And we realize that your suffering came as a direct result of your voluntary desire to serve your country. Well, gentlemen, at last your country has devised a way of showing its appreciation to men such as you, and you six men will have the distinction of being the first to receive this token of your country's appreciation. So, as authorized by the recent act of the Congress of the United States, and in recognition of the fine courage you displayed in the service of your country, I now present you with the first of its kind, Private Jacob Parrott, the Medal of Honor. Thank you, sir. And by the way, gentlemen, after all of you have received your medals, President Lincoln would like to see you in the White House. During the following months, medals were awarded to the rest of the Andrews volunteers, and the country was proud of its newest popular heroes. But during the next 15 years, the Medal of Honor was to become almost too popular. Non-military organizations began to wear imitations of it as membership badges. Chambers of Commerce authorized special medals for all the soldiers who came from their cities. Generals ordered decorations for whole companies of their men. And eventually, the Civil War veterans themselves began submitting requests by the hundreds for official medals of honor, making their claims years after the war and with no sound documentation that the heroic deed was ever performed. Finally, in 1876, Brigadier General Alfred A. Terry sputtered and exploded. I hereby disapprove the following recommendations for medals, and I'm returning the entire list for revision. Looks to me as if the company commanders have recommended every man who behaved ordinarily well. In my opinion, medals of honor are not intended for good conduct, for conspicuous acts of gallantry. 1897... Secretary of War R.A. Alcher ruled out the undeserving by saying, We require incontestable evidence of the deed with the testimony of eyewitnesses under oath. And in 1904, Brigadier General George L. Gillespie protected the medal in another way. Because the Medal of Honor has been so often imitated, we have now officially changed its design. Today, I patented that design at a serial number 197369. I shall transfer this patent to the Secretary of War of the United States of America and his successors. Then, in 1917, the War Department appointed a board of investigation to ascertain whether any medals of honor had been awarded for any cause other than distinguished conduct involving actual conflict 
with an enemy. As a result of this investigation of the 2,625 medals which had been awarded up to this time, 911 names were stricken from the list. This was a radical move, but it returned the nation's highest military award to the position it was meant to hold. Additional decorations, such as the Distinguished Service Cross, Distinguished Service Medal, Silver Star, and others, were now created to honor the various degrees of courage and heroism. But the Medal of Honor was at last restored to its proper place at the top of America's Pyramid of Honor. The Medal of Honor is to be awarded only to an officer or enlisted man of the armed forces who shall, in actual conflict with an enemy, distinguish himself conspicuously by gallantry and intrepidity at risk of his life, above and beyond the call of duty. But who can say that every hero who has deserved a Medal of Honor has received one? Men who lay down their lives for their country cannot tell a board of review just what it was they did before they died. And units that are wiped out in battle cannot provide eyewitnesses to initiate recommendations for awards. No. The most that can be said is that the Army has made certain that the medal will not be awarded to those who do not deserve it. And thus the Army guarantees that the medal will not be cheapened and that the deeds of those who have won the medal will not be forgotten. But neither the Army nor any power on earth can be certain that it knows of all the men who have deserved the medal. That is why the Medal of Honor is pinned to the flag which drapes the coffin of the unknown soldier at Arlington National Cemetery. Our thanks to Norman Rose as narrator and to Lawson Zerbe for a fine performance as James Andrews. Here's a special message for the young men of our country. The United States Army, the senior service of our armed forces, is expanding rapidly and needs your help. By enlisting in the United States Army, you'll not only get the finest training in the world, but you'll have the special pride that goes with wearing a United States Army uniform. If you have the qualifications, the Army will train you in such interesting career fields as radio, Radar, electronics, mechanics, meteorology, and many others. Why not get full details by visiting your local United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station today? This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station by the United States Army and United States Air Force Recruiting Service. This program featured Lawson Zerbe and Norman Rose. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking and inviting you to tune in the same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. <laughs>